Hello and welcome everyone to day three of the Story Quest Christmas Challenge. I hope that you've been enjoying these videos and that they've been helpful to help you to write your own Christmas short story. So I want to encourage everyone, I'm getting on a little early so that everyone can have a chance to filter in. And I want to encourage everyone, if you haven't had a chance to enter into the contest, uh, and the giveaway for the homeschool quest, I want to show you some of the really amazing prizes that we have. We're going to be giving away an eco tank and over $1,300 in prizes. So what does that mean? What kind of prizes are we talking about? So I'm going to show you. So there is an amazing grand prize that is worth $620. It includes an EcoTank printer, DIY hot cocoa truffle kit, a full year of Magic Core Academy, a worksheet bundle, and a $20 Amazon gift card from Tidewin Academy, a four-month subscription to Explore by Mail, Make My Kid Love Writing Parent Masterclass, VIP access to Interested Ed in Learning Summit, one free cozy crafter crate, a Field Trip Science one-month membership from Field Trip Academy, Drama Free Mom Bundle from How to Homeschool My Child, and the Plan Perfect Projects online course from The Magic Art of Homeschool. This is just one bundle. So for those of you here that are in the have kids in the pre-K to first grade uh, range, you're going to love the Coco Supreme Prize Bundle. This is worth $325. We're giving away hot cocoa truffles, one month of free joyful noise online preschool, Nature-Based Kindergarten Curriculum Guide from the Wild Schooler, Fine Mo Motor Holiday Bundle from the Crafty Classroom, Values Fun Book from Tiny Values, a 30-day trial of live and on-demand Believe Academy classes, My Spanish Magic Learning Zone three-month subscription to Level 1, Christmas Word Puzzle Search uh, Worksheet and Activity Packet from Farming Mom, Help Your Kid Love to Sing Toolbox from Splendor Productions Music Duo, one month of Safety Up Digital Membership for the Little Iguanas Kids Safety Foundation, a preschool winter games bundle from Gypsy Game Schooler, and a snow literature preschool unit from Established at Home Co. But it doesn't stop there. So this prize bundle is for those of you who have kids in the second to fifth grade. This is the Chocolate Bliss prize bundle worth $310. Yes, these sponsors have been super generous and they are giving you an amazing start to your homeschool year. It includes a hot cocoa truffles, one year of love of learning access, French basics flashcard from Owl Learning, three month subscription to History Detectives from Knowable World, 20 great Christian engineers and scientists flashcards from Salt and Light Speed, winter weather engineering activities from Art Venturous Animals, Roman numerals from Zero to a Thousand Unit Study from Teach Me Truth, a 45 day writing challenge from Melissa's Teaching, an informational text and comprehension checks, January edition from The Wolfpack Den, and three so two free months of adventure letters. That's four letters. And then we have the 6th to 12th grade Chocolicious prize bundle. It includes the hot cocoa truffles, the character book set print from Blue Manor Academy, the financially fit course, spring nature study and more ebook from Katie's Homeschool Cottage, Spanish adjectives Google Slides presentation from Skillibrations, 52 Would You Rather prompts, speech writing workbook, and mini video lessons from Green Communications, Adventure Quest and Mystery Quest bundle from Adventure Quest Academy, any two Gina Jude curriculum classes, and a winter photo writing pumps bundle from Sarah's Writing Spot. It's super easy to enter to win. You just sign up. You can use a social media account or an email. Select the age group that your kids are in, and then you read the Homeschool Quest magazine. Now, if you want a bunch more ways to enter and more chances to be able to win, we have a bunch of bonus entry options where you can share and show your appreciation for the sponsors by following them on social media. All of these are totally optional, but it will give you a bunch more chances to be able to win an eco tank or one of the really amazing prize bundles. So if you guys need a link to that, I'm going to go ahead and drop a link to the giveaway in the comments so that you guys can be able to enter to win. If you haven't already signed up for the Christmas challenge, I'm going to go ahead and share the link to that. This Christmas challenge is a lot of fun. 
and you get all the lessons that I'm going to be going over. Plus, I also have a playlist of the past day's videos so that you can be able to catch up. Uh, you will be able to enter your short story. Um, the deadline is January 1st. So you have plenty of time to be able to finish your short story for a chance to be able to win one of two scholarships, a fun reading journal, and a chance to be published in next year's Christmas challenge. We we'll also have three runner-ups as well that can be published in next year's Christmas challenge. So go ahead and go to the link and sign up to be able to get all of your free resources. You get a bunch of get a bunch of lessons, some fun Christmas themed activities, prompts, and you also get all of the stories that I am reading over the next couple of days. Thank you for joining us everyone, and I really look forward to seeing what kind of stories you come up with. So, now that you have planned your story and written your introduction, it's time for you to write your call to adventure. So let's talk a little bit about the call to adventure. This means, this is what sweeps your character into the adventure. Here are the most four common calls to adventures that you'll see in stories. The character decides to go on an adventure. A challenge or adventure is presented to your character and they jump at the chance to do something exciting or make a difference. Your character is motivated to save the day or discover the answer to the mystery. This could be something like training for a race or defeating the evil Grinch. The second most common uh, call to adventure is the character sent on an adventure by someone. This is usually a character uh, like someone in charge, like the king or their mom <laughs> or even Santa Claus. The character can be more reluctant or unsure if they're the right person for the job. There could be something like going to the store to get a turkey or running a sled dog team to deliver presents. So I encourage you to add a call to adventure to your story. This is what's going to get the character to start on their adventure. The third option is that your character stumbles upon the adventure by chance. In the first Narnia book, if you're familiar with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lucy quite literally stumbles into Narnia, and that's what starts her off on her adventure. Your character can stumble into a new world, be a prime suspect for a mystery, find a lost kitten, only to get caught up in a bigger adventure. So they stumble on it by chance. The fourth option is something forces the character to go on the adventure. This type of call to adventure is for very unmotivated characters who are, they're very comfortable at home, thank you very much, and they don't need any adventures. Very similar to the main character in The Hobbit. When their precious Christmas tree ornament goes missing, they have to find it fast before Grandma finds out. So you have a lot of different options to be able to motivate your character to go on your adventure. So let's talk about different calls to adventure that might be good for the different prompts that we have. So I'm going to pull up the prompts. Okay, so a poor family experiences a Christmas miracle. Their father comes home early, a neighbor gives them some firewood for the winter, a turkey for dinner, or someone anonymously leaves gifts for the children. So in your introduction, you're going to explain, you know, the family, the main characters. Are your main characters going to be the people who are giving the gifts or the ones who receive them? So you have to make that decision. You have to tell them what the setting and genre of your story is. And then the call to adventure. They, you know, their father is trying to come home early for Christmas. A neighbor hears that they don't have enough firewood for the winter or they don't have a turkey for dinner. Maybe they hear that the kids are not going to have any gifts at all. That is going to be your call to adventure. They're going to stumble upon the adventure by chance. And so I want you to pick what your call to adventure is. Maybe something someone forces someone to go and start the adventure. For example, maybe your character is one of Santa's elves who's been given a reindeer to keep in the end of reindeer games, but they don't want to compete in the games. They're, they're tired of all these races. They never win. But when they find out that there's going to be a prize, like a super amazing ornament made by Santa himself, and that their mother has always wanted that ornament, maybe they are very motivated now to go and do the race. So in this, your character, this prompt, your characters don't have anyone to spend Christmas with, so they decide to enjoy a festive Christmas Eve, par Eve parade and tree lighting. 
They meet kind families and invites them to have Christmas with them. So they have to find a gift for the kind family. So you have to figure out, is this going to be something where they are given a adventure by someone? Maybe their mom says, well, if you're going to um, spend Christmas with this other family, maybe their, their mom is, you know, overseas uh, in Europe. Or they got trapped in an airport so they can't come for Christmas. And they said, well, you have to find a gift. So they've been given a call to adventure by their mom. Or perhaps they stumble upon it by chance. They find out that one of their friends says, hey, or someone nearby says, hey, if you're going to go there, you have to get them a gift. It's only proper. So you can do a bunch of different calls to adventure for each one of these props. So I want to encourage you to pick your prompt. If you already have your prompt picked out, I want you to pick out your call to adventure. So your different options are the character decides to go on the adventure, they're sent on the adventure, they stumble upon the adventure, or something forces them to go on the adventure. So while you guys are writing your call to adventure for your story, I'm going to read you a couple of stories. We're going to start with The Boy with the Box. It was an ideal Christmas day. The sun shone brightly, but the air was crisp and cold. The snow and ice lay sparkling everywhere. A light wind the night before had swept the blue, ice-bound river clean of scattering snow. By two o'clock in the afternoon, the broad bend near Crigston's Mill was fairly alive with skaters. The girls in caps and scarves, the boys in sweaters and mackinaws of every conceivable hue, was here and there in plump, matronly figure in a plush coat, or tiny fellow in scarlet made a picture of life and brilliancy worthy of an artist's finest skill. Tom Reynolds moved in and out among the happy throng with his swift, easy strokes, his cap on the back of his curly head, and his brown eyes shining with excitement. Now and again, he glanced down with pardonable pride at the brand new skates twinkling beneath his feet. Jolly ramblers. Sure enough, jolly ramblers they were. Ever since Ralph Evans had remarked with a tantalizing toss of his handsome head that no game fellow would ever try to skate at anything but jolly ramblers, Tom had yearned with inexpressible longing for a pair of these wonderful skates, and now they were his, and the ice was fine, and the Christmas sun was shining. Tom was rounding the big bend for the fiftieth time, when he saw, skimming gracefully towards him through the merry crowd, a tall boy in a fur-trimmed coat, his handsome head proudly erect. That's Ralph Evans now, Tom said to himself. Just wait till you see these skates, old boy. Maybe you won't feel so smart. And with slow, cautious strokes, he made his way to the laughing boys and girls, in place just in front of the tall skater, coming towards him down the broad white way. When Ralph was almost upon him, Tom paused in conspicuous silence, looking down at his shining skates. Hello, said Ralph, good-naturedly, seizing Tom's arm and swinging him around. Then, in the situation with a careless glance, he added, Got a new pair of skates for Christmas? Jolly Ramblers, said Tom impressively, the best Jolly Ramblers in the market. Ralph was full head taller, but as Tom delivered himself the speech with his head held high, he felt every inch as tall as the boy before him. If Ralph was deeply impressed, he failed to show it, as he answered carelessly, Ha! Huh, is that so? Pretty little good skates they are, the Jolly Ramblers. You said no game fellow would use any other make, said Tom hotly. Oh, but that was nearly a year ago, said Ralph. I got a new pair of skates for Christmas, too, he added as if it just occurred to him. The clubhouse skate, something new in the market, just this season. Look at the curve of that skate, will you? He added, lifting a foot for inspection. And that clamp you couldn't shake off if you had to. They're guaranteed for a year, too. If anything gives out, you get a new pair for nothing. Three and a half they cost at Mr. Harrington's hardware store. I gave my jolly ramblers to a kid about your size. Mighty good little skates they are. With a long, graceful stroke, Ralph Evans skated away. And it seemed to Tom Reynolds that all his Christmas joy went skimming away behind him. The sun still shone. The ice still gleamed, and the skaters laughed and sang, but Tom moved slowly on, with listless, heavy strokes. The jolly ramblers still twinkled beneath his feet, but he looked down at them no more. What was the use of jolly ramblers, when Ralph Evans had a pair of clubhouse skates that cost a dollar more, had a graceful curve and faultless clamp, and were guaranteed for a year? It was only four o'clock when Tom slipped his new skates carelessly over his shoulder and started up the bank for home. He was slouching down the main street, head down, hands thrust deep into his pockets, when, on turning a corner, he ran plump into a full moon. Now, I know it's rather unusual for full moons to be walking about the streets by daylight, but that's the only adequate description of the round, freckled face that beamed at Tom from behind a great box held by two sturdy hands. 
that pretty uh that came pretty near being a collision so the owner of the full moon still beaming as he sat down the box and leaned against the building to rest a moment nobody heard i guess said tom been down to the ice said the boy eagerly i could see the skaters from patton's store oh, i see you got your new skates for christmas ain't they beauties now and he beamed on the despised really jolly ramblers with his heart and his blue eyes a uh, pretty good little pair of skates said tom in ralph's condescending tone good well i should think so yes and christmas ice just made on purpose in spite of his ill humor tom could not help responding to the warm interest of the shabby boy at his side he knew to him to be harvey mcginnis the son of the poor irish widow who worked at the patterson department store out of, out of school hours looking at the great boss with an awakened interest he remarked kindly what have you been doing yourself on christmas day what did oh sure enough said harvey mysteriously as he round face beamed more brightly than ever well i've been doing the santa claus act down at the patent store about a week ago he went on leaning easily back against the tall building and thrusting his hands deep down into the well-worn pockets about a week ago as i was cleaning out the storeroom i came upon these big boxes with broken dolls in them beauties they were i can tell you the lady jane in the blue silk dress the lady clarabelle in pink and the lady matilda in shimmer in white nothing wrong with them other than broken rubbers that put their joints out of whack and set their heads a roll in this way and that they could be fixed in no time i says to myself and what a prize they'd be for the kids before sure for mom and me had racked our brains considering how we'd scrap together the money for christmas things for the girls so i went to the bus and i asked him right out what he charged me for the three ladies just as they was and he said jimmy he says i've told him my name a dozen times but he always calls me jimmy jimmy he says if you come down on christmas day and help me take down the fixings and fix up the store for regular trade i'll give you the dolls for nothing he says so i explained to the kids that santa be late to our house this year for so many to see after it wouldn't be strange i went down to the store early this morning and finished up me work and fixed up the lad ladies as good as new would you like to be seeing them now he added turning to the great box with the look of pride sure i'd like to see him said tom with careful, almost reverent touch, Harvey untied the string and opened the large box, disclosing three smaller boxes, one above the other. Opening the first box, he revealed a really handsome doll in a blue silk dress with large dark eyes that opened and shut and dark curling locks of real hair. This is the Lady Jane, he said, smoothing her gay frock with gentle fingers. We're going to give her to Kitty. Kitty's hair is pretty and curly, but she hates it because it's red. She thinks black hair is the prettiest kind in the world. Ain't it funny how we all of us want in what we don't have ourselves? Tom did not reply to this bit of philosophy, but he laid a repentant hand on the jolly ramblers as if he knew he had wronged them in his heart. That's as handsome as all as I ever saw, and no mistake, he said. Pleased with this praise, Harvey opened the second box and closed the, disclosed the Lady Matilda with fair golden curls and a dress of shimmer and white. The Lady Matilda goes to Josephine, said Harvey. Josephine has black hair straight as a string, and won't she laugh, though, to see them fetching yellow curls? She surely ought to be glad, said Tom. The Lady Clarabelle was another fair-haired lady in a gown of brightest pink and this here beauty's for the baby said harvey his eyes glowing she don't care if the hair's black or yellow but won't the stunning dress make her eyes pop out they'll surely believe in santy when they see these beauties said tom that's just what i was saying to mom this morning said harvey kitty's had some doubts she's almost nine but when she sees these fine ladies she'll be dead sure mom and i didn't buy him if i had a santa claus suit i'd dress up and hand him myself tom's face lighted up with a bright idea my brother's bob's got a santa claus suit that he used in a show last christmas he said Say, let me dress up and play Santa for you. The girls would never guess who I was. Oh, wouldn't they stare, though, said Harvey delightedly. But do you think that you'd want to take the time, he asked Hall apologetically. And you with a new pair of skates and the ice like this. Of course, I want to if you'll let me, said Tom. I'll skate down to the river and meet you anywhere you say. Out in our backyard, then, at seven o'clock, said Harvey. All right, I'll be there. With the head up and skates clinking, Tom hurried away. It was a flushed, excited boy who burst into the Reynolds' quiet sitting room a few minutes later, with his skate still hanging on his shoulder and his cap in his hand. Say, mother, he cried, can I have Bob's Santa suit this evening, please? I'm going to go play Santa Claus for Harvey McGinnis. Play Santa Claus for Harvey McGinnis? What do you mean, child? You know, Mrs. McGinnis, mother, that poor woman who lives in the little house by the river? Her husband got killed on the railroad last winter, you know? Well, Harvey, her boy, has fixed up some grand-looking dolls for his sister, and he wants me to come out and play Santa today. Tom launched into a long story about Harvey and his good fortune. He must be a splendid boy, said Miss Reynolds heartily, and I'm sure to ha I'll be glad to have you go. Oh, and another thing, Mother, Tom has said, hesitating a little. Do you think Grandma would care if I spent part of that $5 she gave me for a pair of skates for Harvey? He hasn't got any skates at all, and I know he'd love to have some. It's generous of you to think that, said his mother, much pleased, and he would still have two and a half for a little trip down to Grandma's. But I'd like to get him some clubhouse skates said tom they're your new kind that cost three dollars and a half 
I thought you said the Jolly Ramparts were the best skates made. Mrs. Reynolds looked somewhat hurt. She glanced from the skates, from Tom to the skates on his shoulder and back to Tom again. They are, Mother. They're just dandies, said Tom, blushing with shame that he could have despised his mother's gift. But these clubhouse skates are just the kind for Harvey. You see, Harvey's shoes are old and warm, and these clubhouse skates have clamps so you couldn't shake loose if you have to. Then if anything happens to him before the year's up, you get a new pair of skates free. And Harvey, you know, wouldn't have any money to be fixing skates. Well, do as you like, said Miss Reynolds, pleased with Tom's eagerness, for such a spell of generosity was something new in her selfish younger son. But remember, you have to wait a while for your visit to Grandma. All right, and thank you, Mother, said Tom. You can buy the skates down at Harrison's, and I'm going to go over and ask Mr. Harrison if he won't open up the store and get a pair for me special time like this. I'm most sure he will, and he flew away. That evening, at seven, as the moon was rising over the eastern hills, a short, portly Santa Claus stepped out of the dry reeds by the riverbank and walked with wonderful, nimble feet right to the Miniginnis' backyard. As he neared the small back porch, a dark figure rose to greet him. One hand held up a warning, the other hand holding at arm's length, a bulky grain sack full to the brim. Here's your sack, here's your pack, Santy, he whispered gleefully. They're all waiting for you in the front room yonder. I'll slip in the back way whilst you go round. I give a good thump on the front door, and Mama let you in. Trembling with eagerness, Tom tiptoed around the house, managing to slip an oblong package into the capacious depths of the big sack he, as he did so. Thump, thump. That was knock re echoed in the frosty air. The door swung wide open, and Mrs. McGinnis' gaunt figure stood before him. Good evening, Santy. Come right in she said. Tom had always thought what a homely woman Harvey's mother was when he happened to meet her at the grocery store with her thin head hair drawn severely pack from her gaunt face and black shawl over her head. But as he looked up to the big kind face, so full of Christmas sunshine, he wondered how he could have even thought her anything but lovely. The room was small and bare, but wonderfully happy with pine and bits of red and green crepe paper saved from the fixings of the store. And on the large bed in the corner sat three little girls, Kitty, with her bright curls bobbing, Josephine with her black braids, sticking straight out, and the baby with tiny blue eyes that twinkled and shone like Harvey's. The fine speech Tom had been saying over to himself for the past two hours seemed to vanish into thin air before this excited little audience. But in faltering, stammering tones, which everyone was too excited to notice, he managed to say something about Merry Christmas and good children, and then proceeded to open the magic sack. Miss Kitty McGinnis, he called in deep, gruff tones. Kitty took the box he offered with shy embarrassment, slowly drew back the lid, and gave a gasp and a cry of amazement and delight. A doll! Oh, the loveliest doll that ever was, she cried. Then turning to her brother, she whispered as softly as excitement would permit, Oh, Harvey, I'm afraid you paid too much. Oh, go on, said Harvey, his face more like a full moon than ever. Don't you know that Santa can do whatever he wants to? The other girls were received with raptures, Josephine stroking the golden curls of Lady Matilla with wondering fingers, and the baby dancing round and round, waving the pink rope Lady Carabelle of her head. Mr. Harvey McGinnis, came the gruff tone of Santa Claus, and Harvey smiled over at his mother as he drew out a pair of stout cloth gloves. Mrs. McGinnis. And that was the good lady smiled back as she shook the dainty white apron with a coarse embroidered ruffle. I reckon Santy want to wear that out on sun sent wants you to wear that on Sunday afternoon, said Harvey awkwardly. And I'll be proud to do it, says his mother. Little sacks of candy were next produced, and everyone settled down to enjoy it, thinking that the bottom of the big sack must be reached. When Santa called out in gruff tones that trembled beneath the gruffness, another package for Mr. Harvey McGinnis. For for me, what what? said Harvey, taking the heavy oblong bundle. And then, as the sparkling clubhouse skates met his view, his face lit up with a glory that Tam Tom never forgot. The glory lasted, but for a moment, then he turned a troubled face towards the bulky old saint. You never ought to have done it, he said. These must have cost a lot. Ah, oh, go on, the pie was in a distinct boyish tone. Don't you know Santy can do whatever he wants to? With a prodigious bow, old Santa was gone. A few moments later, a slender boy with a bundle under his arm was skidding swiftly down the shining river in the moonlight, as he rounded the bend, a tall figure of fur-trimmed coat came skimming slowly towards him. A voice called out in Ralph Evans' vo condescending tones. Well, how are the jolly ramblers doing tonight? The answer this time was clear, glad, and triumphant. The best in the world, said Tom. And isn't this a glorious night for skating? The end. I think that that is one of my favorite Christmas stories. I think it really encompasses the giving spirit of Christmas, and I hope you really enjoyed it. The next story I'm going to read is A Gift of Firewood. This is actually one of the entries from one of the StoryQuest parents from 2020. This one is by Ben K. Draw up a seat by the fire, stranger, I said to the weary traveler. I found him outside, marveling at my lightly snow-covered field. The snow was not deep enough to hide the thousands of small tree stumps on the property. I'm sure the stranger would have frozen to death standing outside. He was well into his 90s, maybe even over 100. 
and his clothes were wearing thin. All signs showed he was near the end of his time, yet there was a spark when he looked upon the field. Once inside, he thanked me for the hospitality and the warm fire. He kept complimenting me on the farm and the fine furnishings which surround him. I told him it wasn't always this way. I was a boy on this farm, and we were poor even before the drought. Daily, we struggled for food and water. A stranger came, and the, the hot sun dried up our last vegetables, trying to grow. As he walked on our dry, dead grass, my father greeted him from the distance by yelling, Off the lawn! What a joke! It was a dead patch of earth. The stranger complied and stepped carefully onto the equally dusty path. He said he had a Christmas present for us. My father laughed and said he must have been in the heat too long. The stranger gave my father five small trees. We were told to water them every day and ignore the water rationing rules. We were all tired and weak from lack of food and water. Putting these little trees over our needs seemed impossible. Yet, my father agreed. All summer, we used every trick possible to get, gather water. We dug holes to collect dew in the morning, filtered our gray water, and much more. The man turned, returned to the fall and congratulated us almost fiercely. We hadn't noticed the trees grow since we saw them every day, but they were as tall as the stranger. He said we'd have plenty for life. It seemed too good to be true. The stranger said he was a scientist from the local university, working on solving the world's crop and climate issues. Next year, he said these trees would give us flowers for tea, fruit and nuts for food, and firewood. The last part didn't register. How could a small tree do all this? He said to cut down the whole tree every year, except for the stump. Now it seemed really impossible. If we failed to cut down this tree, even once, it would lose its regrowth properties. Such a Christmas gift. We stayed warm all winter long. The paper-like bark catches fire quickly, but the logs burn for days. We learned the best times to harvest from the trees. After about five years, our small farm was full of trees. We sold tea, fruit, nuts, and firewood. We tried selling the saplings, but they never grew anywhere else. The income from the harvest provided three for three generations. Plus, those trees helped create cottage industries in the town. It sounds fantastic, but well, that's where everything you see around you comes from, I told him. The stranger beamed. He said the trees were his destination, and he was a scientist. He told me he never duplicated the success. He could reproduce the trees, but they don't grow as well anywhere else in the world. He theorized on minerals in the soil and other factors for a while. He told me he was welcome to test the soil. He said it was not needed. He was just glad his work made a difference in the lives of so many. So I want you guys to write your call to adventure today and join me tomorrow. We are going to be writing our obstacle and I have a bunch of really interesting options for you and I will help you to be able to write the next stage of your story. Remember to, once you are done with your story, to submit it to storyquestacademy.com or contact us at storyquestacademy.com. That way you can have a chance to win one of the amazing prize bundles that we have for you with the scholarship, the reading journal, and a chance to be published. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.